Adventure. Welcome to a new episode of Technoculture. I'm Federica Bressan, and today we talk about the psychology of the metaverse. If you've been following this podcast, you know that it explores how digital technology influences our lives, our experiences, and ultimately what it means to be human today. Now, if we agree that the social and technological environment shape who we are or influences who we are and how we interact with each other, what will it mean to be human in the metaverse? My guest today has a very interesting theory about it. Let me introduce you to Sam Vaknin. Sam, welcome to Technoculture. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Are you feeling human today? I never feel human. That's beneath me. <laughs> <laughs> you are the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, a former visiting professor of psychology and currently on the faculty of CIEPS. You also have a vast online repository of reading materials and references on narcissism, the largest repository I have ever seen, and all the links will be in the description of this video. So let's dive right in. First of all, would you agree with the statement, which is not my statement, but it may be a good starting point, that the environment does influence or shape who we are and how we are in society? I don't think there's any way to disentangle the environment from other factors. We are, we are born as templates. We are born as a set of potentials. These potentials are encoded in genetic material. So we, do, we are born with certain propensi propensities and proclivities and tendencies and so on and so forth, but these are potential. For the potentials to materialize, to self-actualize, we need environmental information from the environment. And the information can come in the form of stimuli, it can come in the form of cues, it can come in the form of interpersonal relationships. Other people are very often our environment, our immediate environment. But the outside definitely determines how these potentials unfurl, unfold, and become. The process of becoming is conditioned 100% by the environment. And if the environment changes across time, historically, but also across space, because it's not the same to be alive and on planet Earth, here where I am, or where you are, or somewhere else on the planet. So the environment does change across space and across time, and this would simply prove the basic point of psychohistory. I think uh, the physical environment is relevant when we discuss collectives, when we discuss groups of organisms. Uh, the physical environment determines evolutionary processes in populations, in cohorts. But I think the physical environment is far less relevant when it comes to individuals. Individuals um, are influenced mostly by human environment, by the milieu, by people around them. So people, individuals are actually relational. You could conceive of the individual as a Venn diagram. The area that is common to the two circles is the individual. And so, interactions with other people, and more importantly, perhaps, the internal environment. The internal environment, which keeps changing, transforming, transmuting, combining and recombining, and so on and so forth. The internal environment has equal influence on the individual. So individuals are influenced, to summarize, by other people, the presence of other people, interactions with other people, feedback from other people, and by the internal environment, which in, its, in itself is reactive to other people. But individuals are not that affected by the physical environment. People are more or less the same when they are in a village, in a city, in Europe, in the United States, in prison, outside prison, and so on and so forth. What does change are collective behaviors. When the physical environment changes, collective behaviors tend to change. change. And that is in accordance with the theory of evolution. Now, these collective environments, of course, determines a certain part of the individual. Individuals adapt to the collective environment. 
and um, they change, but these are artificial and superficial changes. There is a core that is immutable, that is non-reactive to the physical environment, that does not correspond to the collective, its expectations, its edicts, its mores. Its... In this sense, perhaps, we are all somewhat psychopathic. The psychopath is someone who defies, uh, defies society, someone who opposes rules and laws and regulations, someone who has an inner compass as to what is right and what is wrong and prefers this inner compass to any outer compass. So in this particular sense, and only in this sense, luckily, <laughs> we are all somewhat psychopathic, somewhat antisocial, somewhat defiant, somewhat contumacious, re rejecting authority to some extent. Luckily for all the species, because conformity creates monocultures, and monocultures are very bad for evolution. Monocultures tend to die out. We need diversity. We need opposition. We need conflicts. We need adversity in order to thrive and to survive. And this is provided only by the what, what I just described as our psychopathic element. I fully agree in that I believe that progress, we have to thank for progress unreasonable people. Someone who said, I'm not okay with how things are, or I'm sick of doing this by hand. There needs to be a better way. So I understand what you're saying. I don't know that I would use the word psychopathic because you go and use this very negative term for something that is maybe functional, but this is where things get so complicated immediately. Um, nowadays, um, there is much focus on the individual psychology. It's my problems. There's something wrong with me. But what we have said so far already proves that whatever I'm going through, I should always be looking at the broader picture. Even to understand myself, I need to see the outer layers. And this is very relevant to today's topic because we have to define environment to then get to define what kind of environment would the metaverse be? Or can we include the cyberspace already? Because the metaverse technically is not there yet. We don't really live there every day. So it's speculation how we will be in the metaverse. So let me ask you this just to fix some clear ideas. Uh, when you talk about the, metaver the metaverse for today's topic, do you include the cyberspace too, how we are online? Cyberspace is, is a primitive um, variant of, meta of the metaverse because it is immersive. When you spend 8 to 12 hours online, then you are in a metaverse of sorts. You are divorced from reality. And this is the case for the majority of people under age 25. People under age 25 spend an average of eight hours a day online or playing video games, if you combine the two activities, online or playing video games. By comparison, they spend 1.3 hours a week reading printed material and another five hours more or less on television, watching television. So, yes, I would say that young the younger generations, let's say under age 35, they are already immersed, they are already embedded in an immersive environment that has very little to do with, with reality um, as we conceive it offline. And in this sense, the metaverse is here. It's very primitive, it's very disjointed, it does not provide a continuous and contiguous experience. Uh, it is not seamless. It is uh, There's a lot of work to be done. But there is already a captive audience, a group of people who are addicted to being away from reality, addicted to fantasy. True. Yet, during, during the pandemic, many people had to interact on Zoom and they lamented actually having to do this kind of interaction. They couldn't wait to go out again and interact face-to-face -face with people. So um, I didn't... That's, really... not, that's not what the studies show. I'm sorry. The studies right. show that people by far prefer to not have face-to-face -face interactions. 
especially younger people. And, and other studies show that people prefer to not return to physical workplaces in order to avoid their colleagues. That's the main reason given. Oh, yeah. So about, about 70% of people under age 25 uh, say that they far prefer electronic or digital, digital interactions to face-to-face. -face. So they, they'd rather not have face-to-face -face interactions. The frequency, for example, of uh, sex, physical sex, which is a proxy, the phys uh, frequency of physical sex has, has, has gone down by 35% among the young. So younger people are having less sex than my generation, um, for example, and with fewer sexual partners. Promiscuity is a myth. There is sexual, a sexual recession, actually. And um, about 40% of workers um, say that they would resign if they were forced to return to the office. And when they ask why, they say it's because I don't want to be in touch with my colleagues. So I think, I think the pandemic revealed to us that we are essentially asocial creatures, not antisocial, but asocial. Society is therefore, society, the concept of society, the structure of society, is therefore an imposition, an, up, up, an unnatural imposition. We are lonely creatures. We are solipsistic. We much prefer to be alone. Uh, hunters gatherers were very small groups. It is when we started to urbanize, or actually when we started to have the agricultural revolution, that we were forced, we were coerced into bigger units, bigger social units. But that's a very recent development. Our species is 1.2 million years old. And our species has spent time in societies only in the last 10,000 years. So it's a very recent development, and it's not normal, not natural, absolutely not. No, absolutely. I largely share that view. In fact, I I didn't, you know, naively mean to imply how we all love to be among other people. It is my theory that we are more asocial than we are social. Probably the sweet spot is not we all want to be hermits and alone, but just with a small group of people. Um, I've had different experiences in my life where I read books like Charlotte Bronte that uh, didn't have a large uh, social group around her. And when she went to London to meet her publisher, it was a, a shock to see all those people, which is the same shock I think I had right after the pandemic, the first time I traveled to Rome, the big city, because it shocked me how many people I had to ignore. And it's not normal. So I'm sure that transitioning from more rural spaces or in any event places where you don't meet many people and always the same, like your group always, and then you meet this large other group of people, someone must have thought, oh, this is dehumanizing because you have to ignore all these people. We are becoming less human. We just walk past each other in big cities. There's something unhuman mm. about that. Well, the statistics, the statistics are pretty clear. 42% of adults in industrialized countries haven't had a single encounter with another human being in the preceding year. And that's 42%. And in 1980, an average, an average adult in industrialized societies had between 8.9 and 10.1 good friends. That's in 1980. Today, the number is 0.9. So from 10 good friends to one good friend, if you're lucky. That's the average. That means that about half don't have any friends at all. Zero. That's the situation. Now, is this a choice? That The only relevant question is, is this a choice? Or is this some kind of change in the environment, in technology, in this and that, which has caused this process of alienation and estrangement and isolation and solipsism and hermeticism and schizo schizoid behaviors, as we call them in psychology. I believe it's a choice, actually. I believe we are asocial creatures. And if we, if we were able to, to attain self-sufficiency, self-containment, and so on and so forth, we would rather not have anyone around, not even one. We would rather, rather live all alone until we die. I believe this is the default condition. 
I do believe, as I said, that processes such as urbanization and to some extent mass media and so on force us, coerce us into larger social units and structures. And this is, I think, the reason for the anomie. This is the reason for the collapse of modern societies. The reason for the collapse of modern societies is that we were forced to live unnaturally against our nature. We were forced to become social beings when actually we are not social beings. Aristotle was wrong. We are not zone political. We are not uh, social animals. We are just animals. And the vast majority of animals, while they do move in herds and they hunt in flocks and, and so on and so forth, actually are pretty solitary. The vast majority of animals are pretty solitary. Um, I'm not talking about collaborating and obtaining goals. We can create ad hoc teams to create to obtain goals, but that's not that's not socializing. That's not the same as socializing. So we should distinguish between these two. Animals do create ad hoc configurations to obtain goals, such as hunting. But animals, all in all other respects, animals are pretty solitary. Mm -hmm. I can't believe you just said that because it's always been my idea. But then again, it's just my idea and I'm pretty asocial. Whereas I know other people who do enjoy going out more than I do. So, you know, it's just me. But there's no shortage of memes on social media about I hate people. I don't want to see people, you know, people stay away. Um, mm, there must be something to that. But um, about the technology, for example... It is a factor in our society. Now, digital technology, but a fork is technology, you know, a hut is technology. Uh, so, um, men make technology, but then it's true, technology influences us. So, it's like the chicken and the egg, and I, I love it, you have it in one of your videos. It's not a matter of understanding which one came first, it's a matter of understanding which is which. Which is the chicken, which is the egg? So about technology and how allegedly it influences our lives, which is so hard to measure, it's so hard to say, but often it's said negatively, oh, social media is spoiling the young and it's bad and trolls and all of this. I actually would like to ask you if for any significant societal change, we can ever blame technology or it's never about the technology, or technology does not initiate anything that is a significant social change? Well, there's this and there's that. There are technologies that do bring on um, a restructuring or reorganization of society. In other words, technologies that serve as organizing principles, technologies around which we construct new social structures new uh, create new norms uh, new behavioral scripts and so on and so forth so these these technologies serve as catalysts and they create new compounds and new solutions like in chemistry and we have technologies that are reactive or responsive technologies that reflect social trends that have already existed prior to the technology an excellent example of the latter group is social media Social media reflected, reflected the fact that narcissism was on the rise. Narcissism started to be on the rise in the 1980s, long, long, long before social media. It's just that at some point, narcissistic people needed a platform, needed a voice, needed a way, an environment where they could thrive, needed a place to position themselves relative to others, to compete, to stand out, to attract attention. So the needs of narcissistic people brought on the development of social media, not the other way. It's not the social media created narcissism. Narcissism created social media. So that's a derivative technology, a reactive technology. But we have other technologies, of course, which have shaped humans, human interactions, human societies, human protocols, human behaviors. We could take, for example, nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons have changed the way we conduct war dramatically. Um, we have become less belligerent, actually. War has, has been democratized and splintered 
So now the vast majority of warfare, warfare is asymmetrical, also known as terrorist organizations. Yeah. We don't have so many big wars. We have many, many, many small wars with terrorist organizations and so on. So nuclear weapons remove the incentive to conduct all out total war. And in this sense, it, wa it was a major transformation because the preceding 10,000 years, everything was total, like war was all out, an all out endeavor. There was no constraint, no restraint, no. So nuclear weapons is an example of a transformative technology. We can think of other transformative technologies, uh, but the truth is that nine out of 10 technologies are reactive, not transformative, reactive. And so we shape technology. Technology rarely shapes us to start with. What technology does, it enhances some aspects. It brings out latent or hidden um, qualities and traits in people. It legitimizes certain behaviors and delegitimizes other behaviors and so on and so forth. So it's these are the, the these kind of technologies become uh, regulators, a form of external regulation. They regulate our internal world, while the transformative technologies become organizing principles. They structure society. It's very similar in biology, but you have chemicals in biology that induce a massive change in who you are and what you are. For example, all the chemicals involved in pregnancy, they create the embryo, then they shape the embryo, then they and these chemicals help help you to become. Without these chemicals, you would never become a human being. So these are organizing chemicals, if you wish. And then you have many other chemicals that actually don't do anything except, for example, accelerate processes. These are known as catalysts or enzymes. Enzymes do this. These are chemicals which just speed up processes. They are, they just, you know, they they help things move on, move along. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that I would add to, to what I just said that, that um, prompted uh, you to give this answer is, um, I said men make technology and then the technology influences us. In fact, few men, few people come up with certain technologies and they don't truly bring on a significant change until they get massified, like self-driving cars, they exist, but they haven't changed the face of the planet yet. I don't own one, but it exists. We have to wait for some more time. So in fact, all those people who as soon as the first social media platforms were available started sharing their dinner, which shocked me. I didn't know that humanity was waiting for that. Um, they didn't make that platform. They were given that platform and sort of collectively uh, chose to use it that way. So I understand what you're saying, that it's not that technology generates something. It's already dormant, and then you have a way yes, to people, express let's that. Let's put it this way. Let's put it this way. These people wanted to share their dinners, but they couldn't. And then they the technology yeah. catered, catered to, their, to their wish. These people thought that their dinners are cosmic events, amazing things that should be documented for posterity. <laughs> and then social media. That's the, nurse, to this the narcissistic thing. part. Like my yes, dinner is so important. Yeah. Mm. Um, and all these changes, regardless of what they are, we can talk about the, the metaverse or today or what happened in the 1900s. Um, are they out of our control? Because nobody's really guiding this and steering but once the process has started snowball effect there's no stopping so those the social media are ruining us and i'm always like yeah well who's in charge do we have power over who we are technologies that we use and it seems out of our control almost to the point of saying which i'm often critical about like we talk about technology as it just happens and we are you know, on the receiving end, and poor us. Yeah, we share our dinners, and this is society today. I wouldn't be so passive, but yet again, these large phenomena seem to be out of our control. I think it's even deeper than that. Yes, I agree with your observation, but I think it's more profound than that. 
I'm a technophobe, philosophically. I'm a technophobe. I think there has I cannot recall a single technology that has led to positive outcomes. Not one. And that includes the invention of the arrow and the wheel. And the wheel. I cannot think of a okay. I cannot I cannot think of a single technology that has had long term positive outcomes. Um, take the agricultural revolution, for example, the green the agricultural revolution in the sixties and the fifties and the sixties. It led to a total destruction of the soil all over the world. The the soil, the ar the arable soil, the soil that can be used for agriculture, is totally ruined nowadays all over the world in India, in the United States, you name it. Um, Take, for example, um, I mentioned the wheel. The wheel is a, is a great example. These inventions, the wheel, the arrow, the sling, the slingshot, the, these inventions allowed us to multiply. In general, the main function of technology is to allow us to multiply, to reproduce more efficaciously and to populate more, more parts of the world at the expense of other species. Is this, in general, a good idea? I'm not quite sure of that. And actually, the environmental movement, the philosophy of the environmental movement, is that it's not such a good idea. That we have overpopulated the planet. That we are destroying the planet, and by implication, ourselves. And yet, all these major technological innovations helped us, help, helped us to multiply beyond the Malthusian limit help us to reproduce unsustainably and to destroy everything in our wake. So is this a good thing? I don't think it's a good thing. I think we would be, it would be very challenging to conceive of a single technological innovation that has had long-term positive outcomes or consequences. Not even one. And that includes modern medicine. Modern medicine is keeping people alive who should have died. Modern medicine, modern medicine is eugenics. It's a form of eugenics, but reverse eugenics. Modern medicine is the reason. Modern medicine is the reason. We have um, pandemics such as heart, heart attacks and heart failures, pandemics such as cancer, pandemics such as dementias. These are old age diseases. All of them are old age diseases. And old age itself is probably a disease. And all these were brought on by modern medicine. They are iatrogenic. They were created by medicine. And so I am not quite sure that our challenge to natural selection and survival of the fittest was such a brilliant idea, a challenge known as modern medicine. So but, I am yeah. very hard pressed. I'm very hard pressed to think of a single technology that has had positive outcomes. Take, for example, the print, Gutenberg's print, printing of books, and so on and so forth. There's been a direct correlation between the printing of books, the Reformation, Lutheranism initially, the rise of Narcissism, because the Lutheranism and Protestantism are narcissistic. Variants of religion, highly narcissistic variants of religion. So the rise of narcissism. And then the revolutions all over Europe in the 18th and 19th century, which were fueled by pamphlets and print matter, printed matter. And these revolutions didn't bring on a time of tranquility and peace and prosperity and these revolutions led, led inexorably and directly to Auschwitz and to Stalin mm. and to okay. Mao. So you could easily draw a line between the democratization of print and Nazism, fascism, communism, and so on and so forth. This is the technology that enabled these philosophies and ideologies. I cannot, I'm a technophobe in this sense. 
I don't think we have ever controlled any technology. <laughs> hmm. It's just we, we are deceiving ourselves. We have never controlled any technology. Technology has controlled us and led us down. The, yeah. I think I take issue with a couple of small things you said, which I do want to address. I also want to move forward in the conversation. Um, but uh, I think... Feel, feel free to disagree. <laughs> it's the essence of dialogue. No, well, facts prove what you just said. So I, I don't disagree. I just believe that um, when I was carrying things on my shoulders and I was sick of it, I was the unreasonable woman of that time and I said I need a better way and I come up with the wheel for example that does not imply I wanted to make my life better my life here that doesn't imply that I had to multiply that kind of a byproduct a side effect even the invention of print I don't think that leads as a consequence to Nazism you're skipping something in between there or you're just saying that whatever technology we are given as humans some of us not all of us will just use it badly which is what can go no, wrong will no, you're you're both you're both committing a fallacy and not completely up to date when it comes to your history the fallacy right. is the fallacy is that what is beneficial and what is a utility on the individual level is not always beneficial and utilitarian on the species level. The well-being and the good of the individual are not the same as the well-being and the good of the species. For example, each and every one of us would like to reproduce and multiply. That would make us feel good. Well, some of us make us feel good, and, you know, but it's very bad for the species. Uh, the species needs us to die. The species needs us to pass on. The species needs to not waste enormous resources on healthcare, for example. It's a huge waste of resources on the species level. Of course, if I get cancer following this conversation, I would like to prolong my life by another five to ten years in order to have another conversation with you. But that would be good as far as I'm concerned as an individual it would be a waste of resources as far as the species. So this is the policy. And the, a bit of a, in the example that you have chosen, a bit of a lack of uh, knowledge of history, the print revolution absolutely started off as a form of rebellion. The idea was to translate the Bible into the vernacular, into vernacular languages, so as to abolish the monopoly of the Catholic Church via its ownership of Latin, which no one spoke anymore. So the mediation of the priests, the mediation of the clergy um, was, was uh, perpetrated and perpetuated via the Latin language. So the idea was to translate the Bible into vernacular languages, such as English and German, and what have you, and then print as many copies as possible and distribute them to the people. The print revolution was an integral part of the emergence of the Reformation, absolutely. And the Reformation is narcissistic, led to narcissism. That's not my, unfortunately, that's not my idea. That is common, that's the common view of Protestantism, because Protestantism emphasized the individual and the individual's relations with God. And Protestantism came up with a concept of a chosen individual, an individual chosen by God. And Protestantism came up with the work ethic, the Protestant work ethic, where if you are rich, it means that you have been blessed and chosen by God. All the elements of Nazism are, are in Protestantism, 100%. So, and that's not my, again, that's not my, unfortunately, not my original insight. So, yes, there is a direct line between the invention of print, the, the attack on the Catholic Church as an institution, the rise of reformation, Nazism, there's a direct, absolute direct line. There is no denying, however, there's no denying, however, cannot be denied, that printed matter was used in all the major revolutions. It, this was the medium through which revolutionary ideas were communicated. It was a viral vector of revolutionary ideas. 
Das Kapital is not a musical. Das Kapital is not a movie. Das Kapital is not a streaming service. Das Kapital is a book. Long, big, boring book. But mm. still, it's a book. Um, Everything yeah. was communicated through printed matter. And so, it's exactly as we cannot deny the role of Twitter in certain social movements and revolutions in the past 20 years or 15 years. We cannot deny that Twitter has been very instrumental in the Arab Spring, in Egypt, for example. So that's what I was yeah. trying to say. That it, and it's not true that these technologies were abused by a small minority of people. These were mass movements. <laughs> these were gigantic mass movements. And people were using printed matter as a way to mobilize, as a way to, to incentivize, as a way to communicate, as a way to plan, as a way to act together, and so on and so forth. This was the glue that held people together, printed matter. So we cannot minimize the role of printed matter in the disintegration of Europe and what came after that, which was essentially the counter reaction, reactionary forces, such as Nazism and fascism. And so. we, we have been indoctrinated and brainwashed to believe in, in paradigms. And then we find it very difficult to step outside the paradigm and investigate it as rationally as we can. So, for example, the paradigm that growth is always good, the paradigm that economic growth especially, the paradigm that progress is linear and not cyclical, the paradigm that technology is a solution or at least a potential solution to our problems. Absolutely. Technologies. All this, all this uh, the paradigm that urbanization is an indicator of progress. So if we if we talk about whether one country is more advanced than another, we would say it's more urbanized. You know, these are all paradigms. This these are not realities. These are we impose them on realities. We can definitely feel free to challenge them. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That every problem has a solution. Yes, for every problem is a solution. It? Every disease is a cure. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, we are smarter than that, at least in in this room. You're, you're on. You're so, on maybe. <laughs> yeah. Oh no! Actually, in another of your videos, because I did prepare for this interview, you challenged the very use of words to define things. How does the use of the word space influence how we think and study space? So, uh, I'm there, right with you. I'll push back just a little bit because. Um, um, I, I'm not an expert on how uh, printing technology came to be, but a bit more on how recording technology for sound came to be. And when you look into it, you see that every time a new technology emerges, there are, there's one name that is remembered, like Gutenberg in that case, but there are many people before that did the first attempts and it developed. Those early people who are now mm. forgotten, including the steps of that early technology, um, were not the same people that then misused that technology in the way you said. In Italy, fascism saw in radio early on a great way to spread their message and they used it and there's plenty of studies that link fascism and the radio and how that helped. And then television came. And again, I'd like to push back just a little in saying I don't see that direct a link. There's still... I don't know why I don't know why you don't see the direct link. Do you think radio is not misused in the United States? It is radio misused. It is misused, but it's not the radio's fault or the person who came up with the radio that is remembered and all the early attempts before the people who you know they were copying books by hand. Listen, it's not it's not the virus <laughs> it's not the virus fault that it kills you, and yet we kill viruses. Uh, it's not the yeah. fault of the virus that it kills you. It's not the fault of the technology that it's abused, but all technologies end up being abused on a massive scale. So maybe we are doing something wrong. Maybe we should begin to forget about techno technology and progress. Right. I because know. it's not working. No, because when you say, I don't see any technology that has brought on good, not then one. I say, not one. but it's not the technology. It's then humans. We're wicked, it's or some of virus. us. It's not the virus. It's not the virus. Mm -hmm. that, that the virus has no intention to kill you. The technology has no intention 
to have negative right. consequences. Mm -hmm. I'm not a, I'm not attributing intentionality to technology. I'm just saying the presence and existence of technology leads to negative outcomes. Therefore, perhaps we should begin to change the paradigm and not pursue technological progress because it ends badly each and every single time. And the same with viruses. They don't intend to kill you, and, and yet they kill you. What to do? So you, you kill them back. <laughs> Poor viruses. They had no intention to do anything bad to you. Oh, God, I'd love to keep talking about this, but I got to bring the focus back on the psychology of today and the metaverse. So why in the world, not why are we narcissists today, why there is so much talk about narcissism, which I mind because it's everywhere, the word, the paradigm, it, it's a lens through which, I don't know if it's an organizing principle yet, but I hate all this talk about narcissism and there's something about it. You talk about it a lot. I believe you're something else. You're a different game. You talk about it differently. But I would like you to explain the audience the difference between narcissism and what you mean when you say narcissistic as we are a narcissistic society, to then move to even the worse word, psychopathic, for the, the metaverse? Well, there are, of course, the clinical entities, the diagnoses. So narcissistic personality disorder is a mental, mental illness. Um, psychopathy is a different ballgame, different animal. There's a psychopath rejects society. Psychopathy is more of a social dysfunction from the point of view of society, by the way. <laughs> so I don't think psychopathy is a mental illness. I don't think it's a clinical entity, and I don't think it should ever be a diagnosis. I think it's a lifestyle choice, which reflects a certain temperament, a certain character, certain upbringing, certain personal biography and circumstances, and so on and so forth. These are people who hold society and other people in contempt. They reject authority and laws, they believe in their own navigation system. They frown upon social mores and so on and so forth. They are defiant. They're reckless and so on. None of this is mental illness. These are just people who are bad for society. End of story. Society has no right to pathologize people it does not like. And in many, in, 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 someone can be a psychopath in one society and a hero in another. So in Nazi Germany, someone who was hiding Jews was a psychopath, in, uh, you know, and a hero. In, and the same with Assange. Many people would say Assange is a psychopath, and others would say he's a hero. So a, a diagnosis that is open to so much interpretation, it, it is culture-bound, dependent on culture and society, and period of time in history, that's not a diagnosis. That's nonsense. But narcissism is not the same. Narcissistic personality disorder is a real thing in, in mental health terms, in psychological terms. It's a real thing. And so there is this, and there is narcissism as you, you use the phrase, organizing principle. Narcissism is a way to make sense of our world, to make sense of events, to make sense of the behavior of people, to make sense of decision making, to make sense of choices, to make sense of the future, to be able to predict the future, and so on. So in this sense, narcissism is an organizing and hermeneutic explanatory principle, and a very powerful one. It yields very accurate prediction. And so that's why it's become popular. And people in an age of victimhood, the sociologist Bradley Campbell said, that we have transitioned from the age of dignity to the age of victim. In Amen. the age of victimhood, I think we have, and the age of victimhood, narcissism is very handy because it allows you to demonize people you don't like, people you consider abusive. And by demonizing them, it allows you to angelize yourself. They are demons. I'm an angel. And I'm an angel, and I've been victimized by the demons. It's a morality play. We are back to the Middle Ages. It's a medieval morality play with narcissists in the role of demons. So there is a, a superimposed religious tone or undertone to the way narcissism is used 
even online, even when you go online, you see a typical YouTuber spreading loads of nonsense and misinformation and so on and so forth. And this specific typical YouTuber would cast the narcissist as some kind of diabolical entity, some malevolence oh, yeah. reified, a malicious, a malicious conspirer against humanity. And unbeknownst to this YouTuber, he, he or she is just recreating medieval morality place where there was a character that reified all good and a character that reified all bad. It's a splitting defense. So this is why I think narcissism is so popular because we are, as I said, in the age of victimhood and we need an abuser. Everyone and his dog is a victim and they're looking for abusers. And narcissists, narcissists fit the bill perfectly. Isn't there an irony in the fact that Allegedly, I have to throw out there some blanket statements, but I'll throw myself in the lot. We have narcissistic tendencies and we talk about narcissism a lot, but always as it's not us, it's them. And if we have, if, if, if we have a flaw, is that we are too empathetic. So I'm right there with you. They're bad and we're good. But isn't there an irony in the fact that we are describing our society as having narcissistic tendencies? And I'm not talking about looking pretty on camera for social media. I'm saying how I orient myself in my life. It's my life. I have to do something of myself. I matter. I come first. I have to do this for me. There's a lot of me, me, me. Um, that's narcissistic in my view. But then again... Um, we should not want to talk about narcissism because we wouldn't be want to be exposed. We are exposing ourselves, but it's never us. It's always the others who are narcissistic. Yeah. This sits well with, uh, with two concepts or two ideas created by Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud came up with something called reaction formation. Reaction formation is a defense mechanism. It's when we vociferously and ostentatiously attack a group of people to whom we actually belong. So uh -huh. if, you're, for example, if, for example, you're a latent homosexual and you're ashamed of your homosexuality, then you would, be, you would become a homophobe. You would attack homosexuals vocally, openly, publicly, ostentatiously. You would make a show of it. And by attacking homosexuals, you'd be broadcasting, you'd be signaling I could never, ever be a homosexual. Don't you see how I hate homosexuals? You know? So this is called reaction formation. And the second thing that uh, Freud came up with, he came up with zillions of things, but the second thing in this context is um, what is known as narcissism of small differences. Freud said that the more we resemble someone, the more likely we are to hate that someone. So he said we actually hate people who are like us, not people who are totally dissimilar, but people who resemble us or people who wish to imitate us, to emulate us. So, for example, that's why we hate immigrants, because immigrants want to become like us. They, they want to adopt the American dream or the European dream. They want to have a home, a house. They want to go to a university. They want to become doctors and lawyers. They want to become us. So that's why we hate immigrants, because they're like a mirror. They're like a mirror. And narcissists are like a mirror. Narcissists reflect to us the parts of us that we reject, the parts of us that we hate, the parts of us that we don't, we disown. And we see these parts in other people. And so we reject them. We say, I'm not a narcissist. Don't you see how, how can you even think that I'm a narcissist? When I'm, I've, been, I've spent 10 years fighting narcissists online, how can you ever think that I'm a narcissist? And I'm telling you that the vast majority of YouTubers online are actually covert narcissists. Covert narcissists. They are narcissists, <laughs> one way or another. So all these people who are fighting narcissists, attacking narcissists, criticizing, demonizing, and so on, they're actually covert narcissists. Majority of them. Not all, of course, but definitely majority. And when you say this, you don't mean it in the sense of the formation of the self, the nobody's home way. You don't mean it like that. No, I mean it like that. I mean, these are narcissists. They're covert. 
These are narcissists who pretend to not be narcissists. They pretend to be victims of narcissistic abuse. They call themselves self-aggrandizingly empaths. Absolutely. Empathy is a self-aggrandizing term, you know? Yeah, yeah, virtue signaling. Virtue yes, signaling. it's virtue signaling. Actually, Absolutely. it makes me think that the best place to hide something is in plain view. Yes. <laughs> this is it. And these are studies in the past, there are studies in the past four years that have shown, demonstrated that uh, virtue signaling is intimately connected to what is known as dark personalities. Um, these are studies, okay. not some vacuum. Studies in Israel, studies in British Columbia, studies in Taiwan, various cultures, very different societies, and so on and so forth. In all these places, virtue signaling has been linked to dark personalities. Dark personalities are personalities with subclinical narcissism, subclinical psychopathy, and Machiavellianism. So there is competitive victimhood. There is the, the abuse of self-imputed victimhood to create entitlement. I'm entitled because I'm a victim. You owe me because I'm a victim. I have new rights generated by my victimhood, which I did not possess before. And now these rights impose on you obligations, commensurate obligations. It's a manipulative instrument. This is the situation now. And that's why narcissism is so popular. Not only can you attack the narcissist, by, uh, but attacking the narcissist pays. It's, it's self-efficacious. It's been beneficial to you. You make money. You become famous. You know, mm -hmm, there is mm -hmm. a lot of incentive to attack narcissism. Right, right. So I will not respond to that because, of course, I'd love to talk to you for another six hours, but I bring it back to the metaverse and I say, I'll just put it like this. Um, I can uh, observe and I can agree with the fact that part of this narcissistic tendencies, as in um, self-aggrandizing actions, etc. It's like you see yourself. It's an organizing principle as in I matter. I need to do something with my life. You know, um, I do this for me. I need to do what's good for me. You have to be good for me. If you're not good for me, you're not good, etc. But I'm still one among many. I have to stand out. I have to be prettier, more successful, richer, nicer, more successful with men. But I'm still one among many. So there is a relationship there. In the metaverse, because of how solipsistic that space is, I am all there is. Is this the psychopathic part? Others are not in the equation anymore. The metaverse is a serious threat, possibly the most serious threat until now, in terms of the empowering technologies that could lead, lead us astray into very, very bad outcomes. And that is, because, that is because the metaverse represents a commodification or commoditization of reality. So until now, we have had the attention economy, where we monetize attention. We convert attention to money. We convert your eyeballs, your surfing habits, and so on. We convert them to money. And now we are entering a period where several high-tech giants are trying to take over reality, create an alternative to reality, and monetize that alternative. So this is a war on who will control your reality in the future. Right now, there's a war who will control your attention. Before that, there was a war who will control your wallet, your money, consumerism. The next war is who will control your access to reality? Who will control the reality that you see? In short, who will control your reality? So it could be Google, it could be Facebook, it could be Amazon maybe, it could be you know one of these. And when you subscribe to their metaverse, they will control the way you perceive reality. And they will, they will be able to channel you or redirect you, if you wish, into an alternative reality, which is very profitable to them, uh, or which caters to some needs of yours, and so on. So this is a war on who controls reality. That's the first, the first element. The second element, even in, uh, in the metaverse, 
there will be collective activities. People will acquire avatars and they will interact through avatars and so on and so forth. There will be, will be collective activities, but it will all be in what we call a paracosm. A paracosm is a fantastic space that does not have to share anything in common with re actual reality as it is unfolding and happening. So you would be shunted into a, an alternative virtual reality, and then you will have to obey the rules of that reality, the natural laws, the physical laws of that reality, as well as the social laws of that reality. And the problem is, it would change your psychology. You remember we started the conversation by talking about the influence of the environment. And I said that the physical environment has, has an effect on collectives, but the mental environment has an effect on the individual. The metaverse is mental, is not physical. It's not a physical environment. So it's going to change your psychology. It's going to recondition you, reshape you, reframe you, create a new you. Now, you would not feel it. It would be glacial and incremental. And But before you know it, you're going to be estranged from yourself. You're going to not recognize yourself anymore. You're going to be totally alien, a stranger to yourself, a process known as estrangement. We already have a metaverse in action. It's known as shared fantasy. When the, when the narcissist starts to have a relationship with you, he creates a fantastic space. He creates a story, a narrative, a fantasy. And the condition for having a relationship with the narcissist is to accept the fantasy as real, to pretend together with the narcissist that his fantasy is not a fantasy. It's actually reality. And that reality is wrong is erroneous, mistaken. So we do have an experience with metaverses. Absolutely, the, absolutely the a relationship with the narcissist is a metaverse. So we know that it ends very badly. We know that it ends horribly. Tell me about it. Yet, metaverse, we could expect to in the, the metaverse, not the relationship with the narcissist, the, the metaverse, to go in and out of that space. It, we don't know. We don't know. You're right, yes. But in You're and right. out. But I don't think I don't think it will be the case. So because for example, we know that video games who are which yeah. are immersive. We have experience with immersive technologies. It's not we are not totally speculating. We know that immersive technologies create addictions. And these addictions increase in time. Like all addictions, they create tolerance and they increase in time. So absolutely, that's why in, that's yeah, why yeah, in the yeah. DSM five, in the DSM five, in the last edition, the text revision two years ago, they included addiction to immersive technologies. There is actually a diagnosis. They did, they addiction. did, yeah. I, I tried virtual reality a couple of years ago. Um, it's all documented because I was doing a research project on this. And it was that one that I tried was so beautiful that I didn't want to come out. And I thought yeah. in a few years when it's a thing that people don't want to come out. Remember, I said this. It can be a disorder. I, I got it. So, yeah. So many. There's another, there's another thing, I think, if I may. If I may Go ahead. There's another thing. The metaverse is not only a multiplayer environment. It's not only a, a kind of place you go to to entertain yourself and then you go out. In the metaverse, there are going to be shopping malls. You could do your shopping on the metaverse. You will go to work in the metaverse. Your company will have a virtual office in the metaverse. So you will go to work in the metaverse. It's a total environment, not only immersive. You have no reason to exit the metaverse. You want to read a book, there's a library there. You want to do shopping, you can shop in the metaverse. You, the only time you will have to plug out is to open the door to the pizza delivery man, which you have ordered in the metaverse. Exactly. We still have bodies. Uh, we still have bodies, unless some dystopic movies and books are right. Why not? That we will be just floating in some capsules 
with elect droughts. <laughs> I don't know. Um, what did I want to say about metaverse coming in and out? That I believe that there will be a psychological change, but if anything, because it's going to happen in enough years and decades that I'll be dead and new generation will be born into that. Like, I have no clue how uh, someone born now or 10 years ago experiences reality because we have mobile technology. I used to backpack before the advent of mobile technology or the internet even. Yeah, I'm that old. And uh, when I traveled again, then I thought, um, well, it's not the same. I talk to my friends all the time. I want to be gone. When I travel, I travel. And I realized one day that even if I left the phone at home, it wouldn't be the same because the very existence of the possibility of doing that has changed the way in which I consider distances, relationships. So I have already no clue what is the, I don't want to say Weltanschauung, but really perception more of the world of someone born now with it, the internet yeah, as it is. Native, uh... So, native native di digitals, digital natives have been studied by psychologists such as Twenge, Campbell, and so on and so forth. We know that they perceive reality completely differently. They perceive technology as an umbilical cord. It's like a womb. Their perception of technology is like a womb. And of course, the word for womb is matrix. Matrix is a womb. So they perceive it as a womb. Another thing I think we, which is very overlooked is that the metaverse will be coupled with haptic technologies. It will provide a total experience because it provides the experience of touch and smell. Touch and smell. So the falsification of reality would be complete and total. Whereas today, where we enter, enter a multiplayer game or whatever, we know somewhere in the back of our minds that it's, there's reality and there's a game. Even so, it's addictive. But imagine that you would have olfactory input, you will have tactile input, you will have auditory input, you will have visual input. Your brain will be deceived. Our brains are, in this sense, quite primitive. Let me give an example of a hint of the metaverse. Pornography. Our brains cannot tell the difference between an actual sex act and pornography. Cannot which is why pornography is extremely addictive. When we watch pornography, that is especially true of men, by the way. The men react to visuals much more than women. women. Women react to speech or to text. Men react to visuals. So narratives, when a man, so storytelling. Yes, women. Women prefer narratives and storytelling. And so on. Men prefer visuals. Even partial visuals, visuals. Even a part of a body represents uh, the totality. Cynic talk. So... Uh, when a man observes, watches pornography, his brain interprets it as actual sex. Now imagine pornography that comes with haptic, with a touch, sense of touch, smell, uh, holograms, holograms, and uh, audio that comes from all directions. The brain will not be able to tell that this is not real sex, period. And it's much preferable to sex because the partner is controlled. There's no risk of persecution if if, if there's a complaint. You know, it's it's a much preferable alternative to real sex. And the brain is totally satisfied. There's no feeling that you have missed anything. Yeah, Nothing. It, it doesn't have to be the only sex there is. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> the sky's the why limit. Would, I would... Would any man, why would any man risk having sex with a real woman if he has the exact exact level of satisfaction and gratification with a digital electronic version i fail to see any motivation mm. except oh. rapists except rape for rapists and so on this is not speculation we already know from studies mm. that mm -mm. Among, <laughs> among certain generations there is a preference for pornography over actual face-to-face -face encounters. But we know that this... When you say, why would any man have said... It's like saying, for me, 
if I can have cake every day, why would I eat anything else? Well, because I know that it's not good for me, because it has to do with balance. It's, it's, it's exactly sex. It's not cake. You can choose different partners, different smells, different different uh, haptic uh, programs so that you feel differently with each woman. It's not cake. Yeah. It's one day cake, one day bread, one day soup. It's uh, absolutely the, the total experience. There will be a library. You, there will be 15,000 types of women. 460,000 types of touch, uh, 2 million types of smelling, and you will be able to program. <laughs> well, sign me in. <laughs> the thing okay. is, as long as there's free choice, I guess. But that's, that would be metaverse. That would be in the metaverse. Yeah. So and, you asked me about uh, that would be a divorce from reality. Hmm. No. Can say that reality is overrated and the totality of human history was moving away from reality. Yes, 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 we could, yes. We yes. could reconceive of history as a move away from reality. And that's okay. That's okay. That's one way of, to, of interpreting. And in this sense, the metaverse would be the culmination of human history. A good thing, uh, the, the ultimate. In But reality does have its um, functions. Consider, for example, agriculture. Agriculture fosters intimacy because you're intimate with the land, you're intimate with the soil, you're intimate with other animals, you're intimate with it. its intimacy. Agriculture is an extremely intimate activity. Immersive. Agriculture, immersive in, in many ways. Agriculture forces you to delay gratification. You saw today, you reap in six months. You must delay gratification. Agriculture forces you to plan. You need to plan in order to, to, to accomplish, you know, harvests and so on. So ag agriculture, uh, also agriculture fosters collective uh, activities. So agriculture, which is reality, no one would say that agriculture is virtual. Agriculture, which is reality, has many advantages that would not be available and cannot in principle be available in any digital or ele electronic version of reality. So the, the new reality, the virtual or digital reality, escape from actual reality, the fantasy option, um, is problematic. Because after all, there is a physical environment with tornadoes, with climate change, with hurricanes, with fires. With There is a physical reality. And if you immerse yourself in a universe that is fantastic and doesn't teach you the basic skills to cope with the physical reality, at some point you will go extinct as a species. As simple mm -hmm. as it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Of, of course, whatever we do, how much we sophisticate these technology, we become software. We will always be running on a hardware, which is the planet, mm -hmm. of course. Yeah. Um, I'm right there with you. Reality is overrated. I would like to specify traditional agriculture because I've had podcast episodes on growing crop in space, you know, with the new technologies. So the old days agriculture, I'm right there with you also with nature and how it teaches us um, lessons. Since we have a couple of minutes left, I would like to kind of clarify once again this thing, not because I'm obsessed with it, just because it's too big a concept to leave vague at the end of an episode that deals with this, which is this psychopathic tendency. Evolution allows for every flavor of human beings that we see around us, including the maladaptive strategies, you know, um, all of them, narcissism. So that that's interesting, that evolution would allow for all of those things to happen. Maybe there is a space. And in the particular case of psychopathic people, you think that it's society that doesn't like them, but first of all, do you really think that it could be a good way to, to be, to be like that? And what traits exactly you think that will become dominant or we spread in society that are described as just this lack of empathy. What is the next, what is to be expected? What do you mean? Because it's such a bold statement that it's also a slogan, but you have to unpack it just a little bit. What do you mean that we will be psychopathic in the metaverse? What traits? 
if we go back to the way psychopathy has been defined 200 years ago, when people started start to study psychopathy, they defined it in social terms. They said that it is a moral disorder, a character disorder. They didn't say it's a mental illness. They said these people are not moral. They have a bad character. They don't fit in. They don't conform. They disobey the laws. They cannot be relied on. They're not predictable. They're not team workers, and so on. So, and I think we should go back to that definition. I don't think it's a men mental illness. It's an incapacity to act socially, either because of disrupted socialization process in childhood, or because of genetic uh, predisposition, it's possible, or whatever the case may be. These people don't work well within societies. Now, in the metaverse, or in future technologies, not only the metaverse, immersive technology, you wouldn't need to work with people. You wouldn't need to work with people. You would, you could opt, you could choose to become your own universe, as you said, solipsistic, no totally self-reliant, self-sufficient, self-contained, self-referential, and so a law unto your own, and so on and so forth. So, and because people are constitutionally asocial, in my view at least, many, many people will find this very attractive. So in the in real society, in the in reality, in the hard world, you cannot choose to be asocial because this is a huge cost, huge personal cost. So you you fake it. You fake it till you make it. You pretend to be social. You smile, you talk, this and that. Okay? But in the metaverse, there will be no such constraint. You would be allowed to be exactly you. You, you the psychopathic, a social side would become more dominant than in real society. The people in you see it by the way in, in today's online world. People online are much more aggressive than in reality. Much more violent, verbally abusive uh, in, than in reality. Why? Because the online world affords them anonymity and legitimizes this kind of intercourse, trolling and, and doxing and attacking. and you know. So uh, people who would never dream, never dream of cursing someone or attacking someone in real life, go online and become bullies and psychopaths and horrible people, obnoxious people. Mm. So let's put it this way. The metaverse and future technologies would legitimize the inner psychopath and would allow people to become a lot more psychopathic without any repercussions and consequences. The same as on the online environment today allows people to legitimize the inner bully without any repercussions and, and outcomes. Oh, many more people are bullies. It's as simple as it. If I create my whole universe, my whole universe around me, but there's no harm done to others. I mean, is there still that element there's you no can't. aggressivity. A, Say, amazing. no, of course I can't entirely. Or if, if I built a whole cohort of uh, synthetic friends for me, no, no, you know? No. Not because you can't. When I say you can't, I don't mean technologically. Of course, technologically, you can isolate yourself and not have any intercourse with anyone and not affect anyone. But you can't because of the psychological spillover effect. If you behave as a psychopath for eight hours a day, when you exit the metaverse, mm -hmm. you would be a lot more psychopathic than others. Absolutely. A lot more. Lock. So you can't, you can't compartmentalize. You can't say I'm a psychopath online, but I'm a very nice, kind, empathic person offline. That's not going to happen. That's why we see huge increase in aggression offline. Uh -huh. Yeah. Huge self-directed aggression also. For example, suicide. Huge increase in anxiety, in depression, in suicide, in aggression, and directly attributed to social media by studies like Twenge and Campbell and others. So I, I mentioned organization because I think cities were the first virtual environments. 
cities were the first experiment at the metaverse. People lived on the land, and they have lived mostly on the land for, you know, like eight, seven, eight thousand years. And then cities came. Cities were virtual environments. They're not real. They're fiction, fiction in brick and mortar. They are, cities don't grow anything. Cities are not connected to the land. Cities, cities do nothing. They are exactly like the metaverse. They're exactly like the cyberspace. That's why it's called cyberspace. And so I think we, we have had experience with a virtual environment, an immersive virtual environment, the city, because you are incentivized to never leave the city. Your entertainment is in the city. You meet your partner in the city. You grow a family in the city. Your education comes from the city. In principle, there's no reason to leave the city. And when you travel, you visit other cities. And you compare them unfavorably to your city, of course. And then you return. It is a metaverse. The city is a metaverse. Absolutely. Yeah, a cu couple of general statements in there. But I should have known walking into this conversation with you that there was no way not to open so many interesting doors to keep doing this. I couldn't even hope to have you on the show today. Now, maybe I, I dare think that maybe one day we could continue this. We have to wrap it up. So besides the interesting clarification you just um, gave, I want to ask, is there anything for today that I didn't ask you about that you would really like to say, some message you would like our audience to receive? Fantasy is far superior to reality. That's the reality. Agreed. And so given the choice, given the choice, people will always opt for fantasy. People, human beings, are symbol processing machines. Most of their equipment is geared towards processing symbols. And we process symbols in fantasy better than we do in reality. Is reality in interferes and intervenes and pushes back and is distracting and is you know oppositional and reality sucks reality simply sucks we are beginning to get rid of things that suck for example we are getting rid of childbearing and child rearing because children suck bringing children to the world and raising them is a horrible activity no wonder one third of women develop postpartum depression and another 20% develop postpartum anxiety. So now we have reached an age of egotism, an age of me first. And we are beginning to get rid, to shed those things that suck. Marriage sucks. Family sucks. Children suck. And above all, reality sucks. This is a great age, <laughs> it's a great age of de-sucking. The suction of the sucking, ah. and we are de-sucking the world. Unfortunately, since most things in the world suck, you know, things don't adapt themselves to us, we have to adapt to them. Since most things suck, we have been very busy in the past three, four decades inventing a platform onto which we can escape in a total way so that we can reject the totality of reality without any compromise whatsoever mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the dream the dream of emigrating to other planets has a similar component in it oh, yeah. like getting away from it all do you know the concept of vacation it's a modern concept people didn't have vacation in ancient egypt <laughs> what is a vacation getting away from it all the metaverse is the ultimate way of getting away from it all and i think it would prove to be irresistible the only question then remaining, who is going to maintain our bridges and airplanes and computers? Everything is going to decay and decompose like in a post-apocalyptic cataclysm or nightmare. So it's a, it's a crucial junction in human history, I think, because for the first time we have to choose between existing strictly within our minds, with the assistance of technology, and existing outside our minds. And it's very, very tempting to reject everyone and everything outside and to stay immersed inside our minds for good. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So much to unpack there. To close this, I will ask, is there a so what after all we have said? Prediction about the future. Yeah, now we're narcissistic and it's bad enough, but you ain't seeing anything yet because the metaverse will bring forth psychopathic traits, etc. Okay, Cassandra, is there a lesson to be learned? Is there anything we can do? Is there anything more? I actually don't regard the metaverse as as the biggest threat. Um, I mean, you chose to discuss the metaverse, but if you choose to discuss threats, there are other threats which are much more, much more damaging than the metaverse. Victimhood, for example, is a very, very worrying development. The choice of victimhood as an identity, the choice of victimhood as an organizing principle, choice of victimhood as something that makes sense of life, something to aspire to, a goal, um, something that defines defines you. That is a severe threat. Similar threat is a breakdown in the relations between men and women intergender relations. This is a horrible development, the emergence of the unigender. Um, Men with penises and men with vaginas. That is a serious threat to the the continuation of the species. And we're already seeing it in the decline of birth rates and replacement rate in in many societies and so on. So there are other threats which I'm much more worried about than the metaverse. I think people would escape to the metaverse because they would be unable to resolve the other issues. They would feel as victims and they would become aggressive and then they would be suppressed and oppressed. They would forego sex and they would forego romance and they would forego intimacy. And so they would have to have it online. So it is the escape from these other problems that would make the metaverse another problem. It, it's it's not the metaverse, it's reality that is a problem. The reality that we have created, which is really, really, you know, as I said, sucks. <laughs> ah. Oh, oh God, I have to ask. Would you agree that there is an element of aggressivity that is the problem? Because to me, being a narcissist does not imply that you have to lash out and be aggressive and being a victim by definition they say you will never be in a weaker position than when you are a victim but the victim you talk about is an entitled victim that will always be right because she is or he is owed by the world and that is an additional step to being a victim is a coming back is a demand is more than being a victim I think the distinction between uh, victimhood and narcissism is uh, spurious, is uh, is artificial, is wrong. I think victimhood is a form of narcissism. It's simply a form of narcissism. People are proud of being victims. They are vain about being victims. They boast that victimhood is a reason to feel unique, to feel entitled, to feel special, to feel that you have the right to exploit others. To feel So this is narcissism. It's just another... Another guise of narcissism. Similarly, paranoia, paranoid ideation, conspiracy theories. And this is another form of narcissism because the paranoid says, I'm at the center. There is a conspiracy mm-hmm. against me. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. everyone is conspiring against me. I'm the focus of maligned attention. Why is that? Because I'm special, I'm unique. Um, you know, and similarly, the conspiracy theorist says, I see things that you don't see. I have a much better critical thinking than you do. I am able to analyze things in a way that you could only dream of doing. And now let me teach you. I can be your mentor, your guru, because I see things clearly and you don't. That's a message in conspiracy theory. These are all forms, mutations and metastasis of narcissism. They are all forms of narcissism. It's like cancer. You start having cancer in one organ and you have it in another three. They're all forms of the same social and individual cancer. And this is why people would run away to the metaverse, because it's really getting intolerable out there. It's really impossible to live anymore. It's... it's, uh, Depression-inducing, it's anxiety-inducing. Reality has become unbearable. 
we have created an unbearable reality. There is echo anxiety, there is geopolitical conflict, and there, it's, I don't think there's ever been a period in human history as bad as today. Now I know, I'm aware of the 14th century, I of the, the Black Death. I'm aware of 19, 1930s, the emergence of Nazism and fascism. I'm aware of all this. And yet I say that this is the worst period in human history. Why? Because in the 14th century, as everyone around you was dying, you still had your church, you still had your family, you still had your community, you still had your friends, you still had your city, you had structures that somehow supported you in this horrible, unimaginable experience. Today, we have nothing, nothing. There's no community, no family, no friends, no, not even the state. People distrust governments, they distrust institutions, they, nothing. No, you're floating in space, you're totally atomized. You don't have any more lovers, intimacy, and it's all dead. So if, as far as individual is concerned, this is the worst period in history because you have everything, you have pandemics, you have terrorism, you have wars, you have uh, climate change, you have everything, and no one to support you, no one to afford you succor, no one to truly have you in mind, no one to have your best interest in mind. No, Nobody, you're alone, you're all alone. And this is why I, th I say that I think this period is the worst in human history. And so why not escape to the metaverse? What is the alternative that should be so attractive for me to say, I will not go into the metaverse? <laughs> what is there out there? Gaza, Ukraine, COVID-19, crazy conspiracy theories, Donald Trump. What is there for me to, you know, one or two good things but i cannot keep going reality calls i gotta go and i need to let you go you've been very very gracious with your time i encourage the audience to check out your youtube channel as well as your website and all the links will be in the description of this video thank you so much for this conversation thank you for having me thank you thank you for having me Take care. Bye-bye.